Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier, joined as always by my co-host Nick Villato. Tonight we're here to break down the Giants all 22 coaches film of their week six loss to the Buffalo Bills. The first start of the season for Tyrod Taylor at quarterback. The first start of the season for Justin Pugh at left tackle, I want to call it, even though he started at left guard, was expecting to play left guard, ended up playing left tackle. And you'll see soon enough, but the film was pretty damn good, uh, shockingly for a player who hasn't played much left tackle in his career and not in very many years. And it was the return for Saquon Barkley, who came back after missing three games with MCL, definitely made an impact in this game, both as a runner and I think just his presence on the field as well. So Nick, we're going to do this a little differently moving forward. We talked about this before the pod. We want to start breaking this up into a little bit of segments and then get into the film a little quicker because I think that's what people are here for. But we can't get right into the film before we want to first, uh, sorry, before we get right into the film, I think we want to go over some scheme takeaways and just general game plan. Like, what was the idea? What did the Giants want to do on offense? What did the Bills want to do to take away what they expected the Giants want to do on offense? So I'll turn over to, here to you first, Nick, and you can get into some of your scheme takeaways and we'll try to talk through those. One thing that was just obvious on tape, and I couldn't really wrap my head around it, was Sean McDermott and the Bills defense was so soft on third down. Like, they were you know. just giving up anything underneath to the point where, they were allowing catches at the sticks. They were keeping everything in front of them, which isn't necessarily a surprise. We always talk about defenses play top down, but they weren't even glued to wide receivers like I expected them to be. So the Giants were able to find a lot of quick passes, and I felt like players like Wondell Robinson did such a good job securing and then getting vertical and picking up an extra four or five yards. Just generally speaking, the Giants offense did a much better overall job understanding what coverage Sean McDermott and the defense was going to run. And whenever it was man, they had that slot fade dialed up. Whenever it was zone, they typically tried to run these three by one horizontal spread concepts to flood the zone coverage, typically with the number three, the innermost receiver running a stick route. And then they would run a flat off it and they would expand the curl flat defender and then hit the stick right before the middle hook defender with a clear out from the number one. The Giants were just doing a really good job taking advantage. It's a coaching term of triangles, man. You're taking advantage of triangles yeah. out there, creating triangles within the coverage and then finding the open receiver based on what the defense was attempting to remove. And it was a little shocking to me because I felt like the Bills were just allowing it to happen to the point where they didn't really adjust all that much to stop it. Yeah, I agreed. I agree with you on that. I think the Giants executed it really at a high level yes. because the ball was just out on those plays. It was just quick snap, hit your back foot, get out. And one thing I appreciated about Tyrod Taylor in this game on those specific plays is just how tight his footwork is within the pocket. Mm -hmm. Like he does not waste any steps or any movement and that helps him get the ball out so fast. It takes him so much less. And that's even with the fact that, and this is interesting, he kind of has a longer windup than most quarterbacks. Like that delivery is not ideal. It's not what you want. And yet it's not sacrifice. It doesn't sacrifice the play speed because his feet are so compact and he's so decisive. Once he gets that football where he wants to go with it, getting it out. And those routes, like those were timing based routes. Like, yes, the bills played them soft, but if the timing was off just a little bit, if the ball placement was off just a little bit, those are not turning into first down. So I thought that was really interesting. I also, also thought I saw some things the giants did to take advantage of how aggressive the bills. And this has been a problem as we've talked about on this podcast, on the film reviews for weeks now, how aggressive teams are playing the giants. And I thought they did a lot of the linebacker specifically. And I thought they did a lot of the good things in the run game, running those trap plays to take advantage of that. That's something we've been wanting to see for a while. Maybe it's game plan specific. Maybe they found something that can work in the run game, but that was interesting to me, Nick. And one other thing I wanted to go over for my takeaways before we get into more of yours is I thought that this game plan, they added a new wrinkle to their boot action game. They started to do boot action to the quarterback's opposite shoulder. We haven't seen a lot of that with Daniel Jones this year or last year with Daniel Jones. A lot of the boot action plays were to his right side because Daniel Jones is much more comfortable throwing on the right. We've seen very few throws in his career of Daniel Jones off boot action, rolling to his left opposite shoulder and flipping his hips around to make the throw. We saw a lot of that with Tyrod Taylor. A few of those throws weren't his best. Like the, the throw to Wondell Robinson that Tyrod Taylor, Taylor for an eight-yard gain at some point will go over it. That was a bad throw. The ball placement was bad. It was inside. That could have been a huge play, and it was late. Like, he should have got the ball out. But obviously, he also had the high at 43-yarder off of Buddha, and that was not his design boot action. That was him just, like, creating something by rolling to his left and flipping his hips around. And we'll go over that play. That was the yeah. best throw I've seen by a Giants yeah. quarterback this season. Probably the best throw since Daniel Jones's throw to Isaiah Hodgins against the Vikings last year. Similar type of throw rolling out to his left, just a little shorter. But – I thought it was interesting that they added that to the to, to what I thought was the game plan, that that ability to not just run your boot action to the right, but be able to run it to the opposite shoulder, throwing shoulder. 
I'm glad you brought up the run game because the return of Saquon Barkley, look, he was stymied all the way up until the fourth quarter when he broke off that 19 and 33, I believe it was, yard runs. But you could tell the Bills were so aggressive filling. And that's another reason, in my opinion, and I know there's a lot of debate as to does running the threat of running the football actually affect the linebackers? Well, these were young linebackers out there. It wasn't Matt Milano. They were biting up to mm-hmm. fill their run execution. And there were routes coming behind them the entire game, really. like They were really selling out to stop Saquon Barkley and the Giants were able to run the football, whether that be in middle of the field close looks where you typically have that extra defender in the gap who was dropped down or if they did align in quarters where you had two high safeties, they were really still shading down. So I appreciated the Barkley effect, which isn't really Mm -hmm. surprising. Also like how, because you brought up the um, the pulling and stuff. We saw GH counter, which not surprised. Mark Lewinsky, dude, like I I get he has his issues in pass protection. He just moves very well. A combination Mm -hmm. of him and Justin Pugh moving. (laughs) It's funny, man. You look at the Giants offensive line. You have, say, Lewinsky and Pugh starting next to each other. Those guys are both fleet of foot, not really the most powerful. They just win with specifically Pugh technique, but they're very quick on the run. Look at the other side of the line of scrimmage. Exact opposite. McKethan and Evan Neal, those guys are just ballers who want to maul you and throw you freaking into hell man they just want to drive you into the dirt they're just mountains out there so it's kind of funny the duality of the giants offensive line also saw some some versions of i formation that we haven't seen too much mm-hmm. strong i formation there was the one play where the giants converted a third and one at the end of the half where they used that strong i formation only they substituted daniel bellinger with Matt Breida and they just handed it to Matt Breida right. and he just kind of squeaked by and got a first down. So little, little tweaks like that. I always appreciate to see, especially when it ends up being successful. Right. And that's something we've saw last year too, with the lead back. I remember Gary Brightwell had a really nice run last year and they used him as like a lead back on a play. So it's a nice tricky way to get it going. I want to talk a little bit about what you mentioned earlier though, before we get into some plays, the Saquon Barkley effect, you know, as I've always said, doing this job, Nick and doing my job with CBS sports, which is similar to this job, not exactly the same. My goal is to just keep learning, and I am never going to want to be the guy who sits on a take lock. Take lock to me is a very bad way to go about this business. And one thing I've thought about, you know, watching that game, watching recent games with Matt Breida and all the other running backs that try to cycle in is there is something to what you're saying, the Saquon Barkley effect. Like there is like now, having said that, Nick, do I think that if you have a 49ers type run game where your scheme and your blocking is so good, that effect can be the exact same thing? Yes, I do. But if you don't have that, which the Giants didn't have the last three weeks when Barkley was out, that effect goes away. So you have to get it either one of two ways. Having a guy like Barkley in the game where a defense is like, okay, we got to sell out to the run, stop this dude, don't let him beat us, he's the guy. Or having a run game as strong and well-developed via the blocking and via the scheme as the 49ers, either way, you're still getting that same effect of having these. And I know there are people who say, oh, look at the studies, look at the stats, play action is not based on running the football. You don't need, but I always like, I used to be kind of be just take that at face value. Uh, You know, watching more film, Nick, I almost feel like it is somewhat based on your ability to run the football and to have somewhat of a threat. Because again, over these last three weeks without Barkley, this run game has just been non-threatening in a lot of ways. And I've noticed it on film. Like what you just said in this game, that was so true. It was such a good observation by you. Watching those Bills linebackers have flow to the play side of a play action run. And then watching the last few three weeks where they're never flowing. They're immediately showing a little bit like they're going to respect the run and they're just dropping back into coverage and getting into a pass lane. And what a difference in the world it makes when you have that aggressive style of linebacker over pursuing towards the run. Two more things on Saquon Barkley. It was also apparent that the Giants wanted to get him involved in the passing game. There were a lot of concepts to the boundary where Saquon Barkley was two wide, two receivers on that side, and then there was a three by one set. Barkley was leaking out of the backfield. Barkley would leak out to the one receiver side. First read for Tyrod Taylor was Saquon Barkley, seeing if he could get outside leverage on whoever the linebacker was. Typically, it was Dorian Williams, and I got to say, the kid. Look, he wasn't perfect in this game, Dorian Williams, but he stayed with Barkley on every single one of those. And Tyrod had to get to his second read and had to do a fucking full field flip and look to the three receiver side to try to find Wandell Robinson on the yeah. stick route. So that happened yeah. twice in the game where the Giants were like, hey, let's try to take advantage of this rookie linebacker. Rookie linebacker really answered the bell. And another thing, the Buffalo Bills aligned often in an under front. So you hear over front and you hear under front An over front means that your defensive lineman that is a three technique is going to be to the strong side An under front that three technique or four eye, whatever it is, is going to be to the weak side. So when the giants run GH counter, that under front is going to be on the weak side, but they are going to pull that, that um, tight end from the other side to kick out because it's the H back coming. But when you have a three technique over there, 
it sets up a really easy double team between the play side guard and the offensive tackle. And naturally that climbs very well to a linebacker who isn't as instinctive like a Dorian Williams, since Matt Milano is not there or like a Terrell Bernard. So the giants were able to open up holes running GH counter because Buffalo was employing that under concept and the geez that that combo block between McKeithen and, and Evan Neal is just beefy bro like two or three plays where they just got rid of the three technique he fell to the ground and then Evan Neal was able to take an angle to intercept whoever that pursuing linebacker was it didn't result in a huge plays every time because the alley defender whether it be Jordan Poyer or Micah Hyde typically filled with such tenacity and aggression that he made the tackle like five yards down the field. But it was an observation that I felt like we should discuss. And I think the giants took advantage of it in this game. Yeah. I love that. I love that they're taking advantage of things they can find in, in regard to that in the run game. So let's get into the plays now. What's going on, big blue banter listeners. I'm excited for the football season for several reasons. And one of those reasons is prize picks, which is North America's largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform. And it's so simple to use. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including professionals, sharks, and people who are going to exploit you, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you just watch the winnings roll in. It's very simple to play and gives you a little extra skin. I've set my picks in less than 60 seconds. There are so many stats to choose from, and the withdrawals of funds are easy and quick. Dan and I will be adding a segment to our show before every game where we pick our favorite stats, more or less yards or touchdowns, what have you, and we'll be discussing why from a scheme, matchup, and game theory perspective. I love their promotions and how easy their interface is to operate at prize picks. I may select more on tackles for a loss from Bobby Okereke or Kayvon Thibodeau next game. They also do other sports as well. It's a really cool experience. Please join Dan and I in the fun of prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. You will not regret it. Make Little Caesars, the official pizza sponsor of the NFL, part of your game day. There are few things better in the world than kicking back, watching some football, and biting into some delicious Little Caesars pizza. Order online during our Pizza Pizza pregame, one hour before and three hours after NFL kickoffs, plus all day on Sunday. And get ready for some football and fun. Choose your favorite Little Caesars pizza or pick the toppings you crave. Old world pepperoni, pepperoni, extra cheese, Italian sausage, olives, onions, pineapple if you're into that. Put it on half the pie, the entire pie. There are so many other options that I don't have time to name. Slap that on a round crust, a thin crust, a stuffed crust, a Detroit style deep dish. Either way, you win. And speaking of winning, Everyone scores with convenient delivery or our in-store pizza portal pickup. So grab some friends and enjoy a few slices during the game. We are brought to you today by Manscaped, who has taken a step up from Halloween to bring your face the cleanest shave it's ever seen. So this season, no need to toil in trouble. Manscaped's all-new handyman is the best way to get rid of that stubble. Featuring a compact design and next-gen skin-safe technology, The Handyman was designed to give you that smooth finish without the mess of a traditional shave. Get the sweetest treat this Halloween by going to manscaped.com and use code BIGBLUE for 20% off plus free shipping. And for all my wolfmen out there, yo, shout out. If you got a little bit more scruff on your face, Manscaped's Beard Hedger Pro Kit has everything you need to tame your mane. This cordless trimmer has a rotary wheel that gives you 20 hair cutting lengths all with one guard, so no more drawers full of extra add-ons collecting cobwebs and is very annoying to organize. There's no trick with this treat. Manscaped has you covered. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code BIGBLUE at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code BIGBLUE. For a look as sweet as candy, get yourself the handyman from Manscaped. Are you too busy this fall to cook? I know I am. Between watching all this mediocre tape, 
DFS, pumpkin picking, whatever other fall activity I have to do, it's just plain tough to find a time to cook. That's why I'm so happy I found Factor. Factor is America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit. It can help you fuel up fast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. And if you head to factormeals.com slash bigbluebanter50 and use code bigbluebanter50, you'll get 50% off. That's some cash savings right there. So again, head to factormeals.com slash bigbluebanter50 to get 50% off your factor meals. So the Giants defense forces a three and out of the Buffalo Bills. They get the football with 14.03 left in the first quarter. Solid start to the game for the Giants. I like this play. You got shotgun Saquon Barkley to Tyrod Taylor's right with Darius Slayton as that H back, the wing back, if you want to call it that. It's 12 personnel tight end on each side of the field. And look, Darius Slayton's going to motion right at the snap. Ends up being a switch release to the field side with Isaiah Hodgins. You're trying to screw with the match coverage. We talked a lot about pattern match coverage with Eric Turner from Cover One to preview this game. You want to try to manipulate the the coverage responsibilities of the secondary. Well, this play, look, you can see the defensive flow with the play action from from Tyrod Taylor, and you can see how the Giants are going to run a smash concept to the bottom of the screen. So you get Tyrod Taylor off platform. Move him out. Now he can use his athletic ability if he wants. There's no linebackers in pursuit because they all overreacted to the run. And now you just run a quick hitch from that original H back being Darius Slayton. And now you're going to high low number 47 with a smash yep. concept. And Tyrod Taylor does a very good job just getting the football out of his hands. 47 is trying to midpoint the one and the two here. It's just a tough position for that cornerback to be in. Safety cannot get over the top to cover the flag. So he wants to sink the depth. He'll surrender this quick pass to Darius Slayton and the Giants will almost pick up a first down. I think it's like a four or five yard gain here. Nick, why don't you go ahead and break down for those who are new to the podcast or haven't heard it, what the smash concept is, because it's something we saw a little bit of in this game. Yeah, smash concept is a two man route concept where the outside guy is going to run a quick hitch, a pivot, something that's very short to occupy a zone defender that is going to be behind him. And then you run a flag route, a corner route, whatever you want to call it behind that defender. So you could see it on the screen right now. You're going to have Darius Slayton. I love the fact how the Giants employed this. He's going to run outside and then he's just going to sit. Now 47 needs to respect the fact that Darius Slayton is sitting, but he also knows that Isaiah Hodgins is running a corner route over the top of him. And the only player who's going to be responsible for Hodgins is a safety who is slightly inside leverage. So there's all the space outside for Isaiah Hodgins to explode into. 47 does a good job staying there being like, I'm not going to allow you to throw this to Hodgins. I'm going to let you have this play to Darius Slayton. So it's just a high, low, half field, two man route concept. Yep. Excellent execution by the Giants there. Yeah, it's good execution. We'll see it from the end zone angle. You see how the defense flows. And by the time they realize what's going on, they're all to the opposite side of the hash where Tyrod Taylor is just moving out to the other side. Quick, easy pitch and catch. All right. Now we're going to get this first slot fade on a third and seven to Darius Slayton. This is a really good release by Darius Slayton to take advantage of. I believe that's Kyrie Elam, who we talked about on the post game show, just did not do a great job. This is a far hash throw. And the Giants confirm this middle of the field close. When we say middle of the field close, that means there's one safety deep, meaning if you can influence this safety to the boundary side, you're going to have all this space to the field side to attack. And that's what the Giants do here. Great release by Darius Slayton, dips that inside shoulder. Tyrod hits the back foot, held the safety in place. He's still in the middle of the field and then just fired this football. And this is a beautiful throw outside the numbers towards the sideline. Darius Slayton's able to run underneath it, touch so Kyrie Elam cannot make a play on the football. Just a beautiful play, well executed by the Giants. Yeah, excellent execution. I love that you brought up it's a far hash throw to the field side. Look at where, and for those of you who want to identify that, you could just look at where Tyrod Taylor releases the ball from that hash mark and then where the ball is thrown to. We haven't seen a lot of field side throws this year. We haven't seen a lot of far hash throws, so it was good to see one here. I love the ball placement here outside shoulder, giving the op, uh, giving the receiver an opportunity to make the catch away from the defensive back. It wasn't the greatest coverage anyway, but if the coverage was a little better, he still would have had an opportunity to catch the football because it was outside shoulder not inside shoulder. I love Tyrod Taylor's ability to hold the safety briefly, middle of the field close look. We've seen a lot of these middle of the field close looks this year with a robber safety or something like that. Just, you know, not a lot of respect for the field side. So here the Giants take advantage of what the defense is showing them with a great play. So it was awesome to see this early on. 
Exactly. And look at Matt Breida's route. Matt Breida's route is solely ran just to occupy yeah. that outside defender. So you have that one-on-one matchup. The Giants take advantage of it. And now we get a third and four. Six and by the way, left. Nick, before exactly. we get to that, I want to say this is something I think they can use to take advantage of how Washington's going to play them next week, uh, depending on whoever is at quarterback, Tyrod or Daniel Jones, because I think there's going to be opportunities like this again next week, given how aggressive those corners play in Washington and watching a little bit of that Ritter game versus Washington. Look, the Giants actually had some explosive plays in this game. I know they didn't score an yeah. offensive touchdown, but they actually had some explosive plays, and that's a welcome sight really over the last two years because the Giants were not explosive at all last year. Now we're going to have quarter one, 650 left, third and four. Do Tyrod Taylor does such a great job with his eyes here to find Wandale Robinson. This is kind of the play I was just referring to. You have a three-by-one set. He wants Saquon Barkley. You can see on the other angle how he checks. You can kind of see it here. He checks Dorian Williams. Do I have Saquon Barkley outside? I don't. Let me quickly find Wandale Robinson. And this is another thing that we referenced earlier. Look how soft this coverage is, man. This is such a yeah. soft zone. You have some sort of man concept to the bottom because Dorian Williams is reacting that way. But when the when the Giants ran these three by one sets, it would be man to the to the one receiver side. But then you have like basically just zone coverage, but it's just so weak. I, I just um, I couldn't really comprehend it. They just gave this gi- the Giants a third and four. No one's even around Wondell Robinson at this catch. It is definitely confusing. Like and I don't can, really understand why they're playing at such depth there. No, neither do I. And watch Tyrod here. Tyrod, see just quick check, quick check. Don't have it. Okay, twenty one is coming on the blitz. Let me get rid of this football. Buy right. some time. Flow away from it. He's not bailing the pocket. He's not doing any of that, but he just knows 21 is coming. Evan Neal takes 90 and there's no one there to pick up 21. I don't know if this is a miscommunication along the offensive line. We've seen a lot of that this season, mm-hmm. but Tyrod understood how much time he had and where Wondell Robinson was going to be and when to deliver this football. This is a good play by Tyrod, man. Just using his eyes subtly to see what he has, feel the blitz, get rid of the football first down. Yeah, you broke it down great there. The subtleties of that play by Tyrod Taylor. One, the ability to check that backside, see that the free blitzer is coming. And again, who knows who's responsible for this on the offensive line? That's been a problem for the Giants. But free blitzer coming, and instead of bailing to the right and trying to roll out to the right and then cutting off half the field, he slides subtly. If you watch his feet, he slides two steps to the left to create enough space to be able to throw that football to where it's supposed to go, which is Wondell Robinson. If he tries to bail here and goes right, this play is dead. Exactly. And this is really early in the game. You see Josh Azudu. I think this is the play that Josh Azudu gets hurt, if I'm not mistaken. I think he ends up falling down. But uh, this is also a really well-executed blitz by Buffalo. Right. You have 90 who's going to go wide. 21 follows him, but nobody takes 21. Yeah. Typically, you want to remove the most dangerous man to the inside if you're Evan Neal and you get 2v1. We talked a lot about that last week. But 91 was just aligned in a four eye. He's going to go inside. The guard's going to take him. Center's going to take 99. So now you have three on two with a one-on-one matchup, Josh Azudu against AJ Epinesa, and then a 2v1 matchup against Evan Neal. It's a tough spot to be in for protection. So the fact that Giants were able to convert here says something about them. And also good job by Tyrod Taylor for recognizing the free blitzer here. I know we've seen plays like this for the Giants go dead with the quarterback just looking directly to the left and then taking a hit, sometimes a fumble and a sack, sometimes just a sack, sometimes just a big hit. He does a good job, in my opinion, of recognizing it so he can get rid of the football instead of, uh, you know, just staring to the other side and taking a hit. Let's get into a 1345 left in quarter two. This is the first and 10. Here is the egregious callback and what a throw and catch by Jalen on the run, man. And that ball is optimally placed. I'll show you on the end zone angle. End zone angle of this throw is insane. Yes, this is this is beautiful. We'll go over a little bit more with this play, but I just want to show the audience this just flicks right out of his hand and then. Both feet in bounds. He has the football. Unless he bobbles it right there, which we can't tell by this view. This is a catch, an easy catch. Gets both feet in bounds. Just beautiful body control and, and just speed and acceleration from Jalen Hyatt on this play. And we'll go over the penalty too, Dan. Like, I don't know what, like this ref, you talk about take lock. This ref knew <laughs> that he was throwing this flag. It didn't matter what happened after because the penalty is one yard past the line of scrimmage at the point of the throw. So if we watch this, the line of scrimmage is the 15 yard line play action. Now, you could see Evan Neal blocking somebody. Evan Neal's clearly one yard past the line of scrimmage at this point. But you know what you can do before the throw? You can put yourself back on sides like it's freaking hockey, right? So watch. He takes two steps, gets one yard, clearly one yard. Tyrod Taylor still has the football. 
Then Tyrod right. releases it. Nobody is beyond a yard from the 15 yard line. And that dumbass ref that is standing at the bottom of the screen on the sideline just wanted to throw that flag and insert himself into this game. This is an egregious call. I don't know why these calls are going against the Giants so frequently in these huge spots last year against Dallas with the Isaiah Hodgins touchdown mm. in prime time. It's just, you got to be better than this ref. I'm not sure what you're looking at. You know, you can change it. You can go beyond two yards and then jump right. back and get back on side. So it's just a, just a terrible, terrible mistake by this referee. And after the play immediately, by the way, the rule specialist, Terry McCauley said this was the wrong call almost immediately. And you know, they never want to do that. Like at the end of the game with the PI, like I was talking about last night, Nick, they first tried to say like, Oh no, this wasn't a PI on Darren Waller. And then he kind of walked it back once Collinsworth made his case. And you know, their default is to say the refs got it right. Cause that's, just obvious in life. And there's but, just um, no there's just no competitive advantage to for the Giants here. And Evan Neal had, had the right. the awareness to get back on side. I just think so, it's a stupid call in general. The NFL is like telling the refs to call. Like we don't need this in football. Like no, we do, guys we do, for, we do for RPOs. We we definitely do for RPOs, RPOs. sure. Yeah, yeah for yeah. RPOs, sure. That's obvious. But like for these types of plays, it just doesn't make sense. And Nick, actually, me and you got different tape on this. I want to show my angle of the, uh, the other angle of this throw from the end zone because I just think it was just insanely impressive. And I, I think people will definitely appreciate it. So I'm going to do yeah. that real quick as we go over this. Yeah, if you can put that up as of right now, though, before we before we uh, yeah. go over that, this is a similar concept that the Giants struck on against the Cardinals to start the second half. It's a little bit different, but it's still a deep post and then an over route where one safety bites down. So it's number 21. This is number 21 takes. You can see how he's going to point and then take Darren Waller. And then he realizes, oh, crap, because you have basically cloud coverage over the top of Jalen Hyatt, meaning you have somebody underneath him and then somebody over top of him. But the defender that is over top of him is not inside enough to cut off the angle of a speedster like Jalen Hyatt. So Jalen Hyatt just turns on the Jets and then he flattens that angle out a little bit to ensure that that safety who was clouded over the top of him is not going to get to his hip. And that's exactly what happens, man. And this is just understanding where you are in the football field and it's just a beautifully placed ball by Tyrod. And let's see it from your angle. I'm going to switch it right now. Here's a yeah, Dan's so angle. We'll Dan gets that good tape. <laughs> no, I think we get pretty equally good tape, but here's just, I just love the angle from here. You can see so many things here. One Tyrod goes into play action, wants this throw, but understands like if he throws this ball, this linebacker is probably getting back into that window and making a break. So he breaks the pocket, rolls to his opposite shoulder and somehow puts that, on, puts that ball out there. Like this angle to me is insane of this throw. Look at this freaking throw again. Like he's rolling left and just flicks that thing out there, leads the receiver, doesn't throw to a spot, throws, uh, I'm sorry, doesn't throw to where the receiver is open, throws him to a spot open on this play. So it's possible here. And I know you had a good angle on this other part of it uh, earlier, Nick, that you put on Twitter. So those of you who want to check it out, check Nick's Twitter um, of Jalen Hyatt dragging the feet. You can't really see it too much there, but he does get those toes in. And so it would have actually been a catch had it not been the bad penalty, even if they had reviewed it. Man, just... Just dumb, just stupid stuff. NFL, get your shit together, man. Yeah. All right, let's get let's get back into the plays here. Now we're gonna have a third and three. This is another slot fade after this play that we already saw from this angle. One more time, man. Your angle is just substantially better than the angle I had. It's so much I mean, better to see. So angle. much better, substantially better. We're gonna have another slot fade here on a third and three. Giants, look, this is obvious man coverage. You have a middle of the field close safety who is deep. Everybody's pressed up on the line of scrimmage directly over the top of their assignments in a two by two, well, three by two set because it is empty. Obvious man coverage, and the Giants take advantage of it once again with a slot fade to the field side. Look, if you're going to play inside slightly to the inside and you can be influenced inside, which this defensive back doesn't even seem like he necessarily is. He does gain some depth, take some steps back, but Darius Slayton just does a really good job accelerating into space yep. and making that catch. This is simple football stuff. Hey, they're in man coverage. Let's run the slot fade to the field side, run into space, deliver the football. And Tyrod Taylor delivering it here. And a couple questions I have just like, you know, we've seen now through this tape, two field side throws down the field, both off slot fades. Well, I just don't know why the Giants haven't been running this. Because here's my question. I put this on Twitter, Nick. If you look at it pre-snap, roll back the pre-snap if you can real quick. Look at how this defense is aligned. We've seen so much of this this season. All 10, 10 of the 11 defenders lined up basically three yards within the line of scrimmage here, right? Like then one middle of the field closed, deep safety. That's it. That leaves the field side wide open. It's a far hash throw. Look at where, where Tyrod's throwing it from. The second far hash field side throw of the game. We should be, the Giants should be able to, to attempt these throws all game, every game when defenses are playing them 
the exact same way we see here pre-snap from the alignment standpoint. And we've seen this so much on film this year. So it's just, I don't know why it took this long for the Giants to call these plays or to run these plays, but it's definitely, you know, an easy solution here almost in a way. It's not easy because you still have to have a great throw there. The timing has to be great. The receiver has to create the separation, but it's so much easier for the receiver to create the separation from the slot there. It is. And I had to fast forward through one play because for whatever reason, it just didn't come through in the video. That would have been the uh, first play of oh. the second half. Another nice slate. Did you have run. the end angle of that throw, by the way, because I thought Tyrod did, I did not hold safety with his I eyes. did not. Okay. But, but just you're right. Note. Yeah. Tyrod, I mean, Daniel Jones does this too. They do well when, when they're taking these slot fit. I think the Giants just liked the matchup against Kyrie Elam and then against the, mm. the other player. I can't remember his name right now, but it wasn't obviously Trey White because he's out with the torn. Achilles and they just knew that the bills were going to play it that way. And if you want to play mm -hmm. man coverage and if I can influence that safety, because this is a team, I don't think they're in middle of the field, closed coverage too frequently. This is a team right. that likes to run quarters. This is a team that likes to have a shell. So you don't beat them with explosive plays. And then they're excellent rallying to the football, but against the giants, they're worried about stopping the run. So they want to play middle of the field close so they can have that extra yep. defender in the box. And I don't think they're middle of the field, closed defense. And I would love to ask cover one about this, but I don't think their middle of the field, closed defense is that great. Hmm. Didn't look like it in this game. <laughs> That's no. All right. Now here is the 19 yard rush by Saquon Barkley. Now this is the under front that now this isn't a true under front because you do have two tight ends on the field and the giants. I love the fact that they're able to run this because the under front, again, you have the three technique. You could see him. I'm highlighting him right now, but you have a tight end on this side and a tight end on this side. Giants used a ton of jet motion in this game. A yep. lot of jet motion, and I absolutely loved it too because it did freeze those young linebackers just a, just a hair to it allow. Also, I felt like Nick. You could tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I felt like their use of jet motion on some of these explosive run plays they had also like a, like worked so well with the oh, aggressiveness. Like Sec exactly. The, this Bills are playing so aggressive before the snap with these second level defenders. And so that helped. Like when you're using these jet motion, it's going to pull guys out of plays when they're playing that aggressively. And the Giants did it all game, and they didn't really use it. Yeah. <laughs> but here, this is late in the game. This is the fourth quarter, and you can see Teron Johnson, a very underrated football player. This kid is a oh, very he had a phenomenal game in yes. this game seven. I had to literally ask my my boss is a huge Bills fan. I'm like, tell me about Teron Johnson, like number seven. Like, who is this dude? He was insanely impressive on tape. Yeah. He's a very good football player, but you can see how the jet motion is going to influence him outside of the tackle box, outside of Darren Waller. And now Darren Waller is going to climb up to 43, and 43 sees the pulling guard because the Giants were doing this too. They were pulling the backside guard often. That's not something new, but this isn't a counter run because there's only one puller. So they were going back to the one puller system. This is a play that Pat Shermer used to run that when it wasn't inside zone. This is a play that a lot of NFL teams end up running. You want to create extra gaps to the front side? Cool. We're going to kick out that MN on line of scrimmage and get that double team block on your under front. That's exactly what happens. Gives Darren Waller a free release up to Bernard. Bernard goes to engage him, engages him, Look at that hole. Look at that hole. Because you can just remove the three technique, right. kick out the end man on the line of scrimmage, tight end climbs up to the linebacker, seven is removed from the jet motioning player, has nothing to do with the play, and now you have a 19-yard run. That is just well-schemed play and good execution up front to the play side. One more thing, just look at McKeith and Neil. Look, I get Evan Neal, people don't, don't like him, maybe rightfully so. Run blocking. This this guy can be he can he can move you. <laughs> he can move you. They just get rid of 91 and then he's able to get a hold of Dorian Williams just enough to not allow him to be that pursuit defender. Now you have Saquon Barkley isolated against Micah High. Good scheming. Yeah, that's that's this that's the multiple times in this game they got Saquon Barkley isolated against that a safety and Micah Hyde or whoever it was. That's if you can get Saquon Barkley isolated against a safety, I guarantee you every coach in the NFL would tell you that's a coaching win. And the jet motion is what does all, does all this, man. It really does. Yep. 43 to me, I think his assignment might be that A-gap, but he still flows to the outside once he sees the puller and then engages the tight end, and then no one's there to, to fill it because the shift, I think, maybe switched everybody's assignments, and then the young linebackers just got out of position. Or 43 maybe just over-pursued. But regardless, it happens again on the next play, only slightly different. Here is a 34-yard rush off GH counter. So now you're going to have GH counter. Saquon Barkley just... Olay's Dorian Williams and then is able exactly. to that one required more of Saquon Barkley making someone miss in the hole. Oh, right absolutely. Away. And this is good blocking again. Now, what, what kind of front do we have here? So this is 
the it's like a four eye three technique, but it's that under front again. You can see to the strong side where Daniel Bellinger is, you have that one technique, that two eye shade. So the Giants are able to establish his double team. They don't even need it because 91 slanting. That's another thing the Bills were doing, which is very similar to what teams have defenses have done against the New York Giants this year, is they love the slant and they love to screw with the the blocking assignments and who are you going after if you're in protection or if you're run blocking. Well, here 91 slants right into the Giants laps, man. This is exactly what the Giants want. You want to slant inside? Cool. I'm just going to pin you to the back of the center. And now Evan Neal can go right up to 43, eliminate him. And it's on Saquon Barkley to make one man miss. And there's a lot going on here. Daniel Bellinger kind of whiffs, but he also takes out two guys at the same time. And that probably altered the effectiveness of Dorian Williams making this tackle. And just that right there, man, it's so subtle, but this is, these are the little nuances of playing running back that I absolutely love. Watch how Saquon Barkley just angles his body right here just to make him miss. He makes contact on him, but Saquon Barkley's contact balance is it's so strong that he's able right. to basically run through the arm tackle attempt of Dorian Williams, and now he just scampers and accelerates and gets behind Jalen Hyatt's block, which is really... He blocks like a dog out there, Jalen. I was impressed by his blocking. Like, look, I know 24 kind of loses his footing here, but the guy tries his ass off, and I can understand yeah. why he is the... I think he was second in snaps at the Giants wide receiver. I think he was ahead of Wandell, and I absolutely love it too, man. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but Jalen Hyatt was really good in this game on his snaps. And I think two things that maybe people didn't expect to get out of Jalen Hyatt, you're going to get out of Jalen Hyatt, and that's that dog mentality, like you just said, a try-hard blocker and someone who is really tough through the catch point. You're on that play now, that next play. I mean, oh, this yeah. was one of the most unheralded plays in the entire game. I know it didn't work out because they screwed up on the one, whatever, at the end of the game, and they didn't get the PI, but this is just an unbelievable catch to make. The concentration level you need to not alligator arm it when you know you're about to get destroyed on a high throw, and then just the toughness to come down with the football and secure it. Also got to love the scheme, right? You're running a lot of zone. You're being a little bit soft mm -hmm. with your zone. We're going to run two underneath routes. We're going to run a pivot to expand this defender, who is the apex defender, away from the throwing window, and then we're just going to sit Darren Waller to occupy both middle hook defenders. So now Jalen Hyatt, all he has to do to run this dig route, the outside leveraged cornerback isn't going to be able to cover that, and now he yep. just needs to beat the safety to the catch point. And that's easy because the safety is playing from depth because they're in a too high shell. Well said. That was, I love how you just broke that down, Nick. And by the way, um, you can also mention, I know we're talking about the fourth and five play. I didn't, don't think we set it up. This was with, with 22 seconds left in the fourth quarter. I just love the job Tyrod Taylor does manipulating this pocket, man. This is mm. a muddy pocket. This is a collapsing pocket. There's little to no space to work with for the quarterback. And instead of escaping right or instead of just running into contact, he just does a really good job of finding somewhere to launch from, finding some kind of new landing spot to make the throw from within the pocket. It's next what keeps the play alive. If he escapes right, this play's dead. Jalen Hyatt's not open by that point, and the play's over. So just a really well-executed play by number two and by number 13 on this one. Yeah, we'll get into Tyrod Taylor a little bit later too, but he, he was impressive in this game, and little things like that can go a long way, especially yeah, when your pocket typically sucks and you're working from a disadvantageous situation. But I absolutely love this play. The fact that the rookie was able to make this catch well-schemed, tough, takes a huge hit finished with toughness and now here's this the last play of the game mm. i just included it in here it's it is pass interference i'm not shocked that it wasn't called but his arm is clearly being held and you can even see it on this angle which isn't the best angle of it but you could see how he's grabbing and grabbing and grabbing but the fact that darren waller had a chance at the football i think was enough for the refs to keep that yes. yellow in their pocket and i think if he doesn't have the initial grab Waller's just able to freely get to the back pylon so uh, some people have said to me nick oh it was kind of a overthrown ball well, yes, because Waller got held up and stymied in his route. If he can free release yeah. into where he's supposed to go, it's actually going to be like perfectly thrown to the top of the catch point where the DB can't make the play with it. If the DB plays by the rules here, it's a touchdown catch, in my opinion. 100%. Yes. Waller gets no, this... the back pylon two ticks faster, and the DB cannot reach up to that point to knock the football away because he's like, what, 5'9", five, 5'10", five, this dude? So it's just against a six foot five Darren Waller. So it's just really unfortunate. I agree with you. I just don't think they're going to call it twice. I don't think they're going to call it the last play of the game after they already gave a free play with time expired technically just before this. It's just so like stupid to me, I guess is the right term. Like how, it is. They, yeah. how you can see one side judge, like you said earlier, make that call on Evan Neal where he's just like still like 10 feet away on the, on the, on the sideline throwing the flag in such a stupid time. But then in a, time like this where it's so obvious and it's right in front of his eyes because you could see the, the 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 field judge or the judge here is right in front of the um the blue of the of the of the end zone of the um not the end zone the uh 
goalpost. And so he's right there to see it. It's obvious to him. He can't miss it. But I think the timing of the player really took him away from making well, that call. If you, if you, to, to the people who say it's a bad throw by Tyrod, I can understand why, why you would say that. But look at where Darren Waller is starting his jump from. He still has what, like five yards left to work with before he gets which to that. He like, which he would have gotten easily. Exactly. And, and he still was able to get a hand on it. Like if he got to say mid point of the L mm-hmm. right here, he's going to be able to jump up and with his catch radius, make that catch. Like this should have been, great. this is the mismatch the giants wanted. This is exactly what they wanted. It's just the player held Darren Waller and it wasn't yeah. called. And that sometimes that's just how it goes, unfortunately. And you can yeah, see, I don't even have any touchdown game. and it would have been awesome. Exactly, man. But yeah, those are all the plays that I, I might have like some combo blocks that I'm going to add a little bit yeah. later, but if you have any plays, we can go over those and then we'll just talk generally about what we felt Tyrod Taylor and then the offensive line too, man. A lot of, a yeah. lot of, um, I would say the offensive line, I mean, it's not crazy, but they played a lot better in this game, but the difference that this, the Justin Pugh makes on this offensive line is, um, it's really evident to say the least. It is. And you know what I'm excited to get to Nick on these next two podcasts, this one in the defensive film review. The superlatives at the end, because it's finally, this was fun film to watch. Yes. I know the Giants lost. I know they only scored nine points, but I'll be honest with you. They could have scored a lot more points in this game. We just saw a touchdown. They should have had to add seven. Obviously, end of half, that ridiculous gap. They should have had three there. In my opinion, they should have had seven there. because. And, and this is one more thing I want to talk about too, Nick, the coaching. So we can do tie rod observations, offensive line observations, coaching, and then get into the superlatives. We'll end, we'll end like that. But, you know, before half, Nick, and we could talk about this a little more later, like, I went over it. The Giants threw that that 31-yard pass to Darius Slayton on that final drive before half, and he got out of bounds after he made the catch. Nick, guess how much time was on the clock at that oh, point? No, I know. 121. I, I did 121 at the Bills' 21-yard line. The Giants proceeded to have only four more plays. Four more plays the entire half. Why? They ran three of the next plays. And I get it. Look, people have come to me, and I wanted to bring this up to you, Nick, to get your perspective on it before we get into some other stuff. And we could do the coaching part now. Because we've talked a lot about it last night anyway. But I thought this was an egregious error because that could have let, if they had maximized the time there, they could have had seven more points there as well. We just talked about the seven they lost on the Waller call. That's 14 points. Um, and then obviously there were other things like fourth and inches. You kick a field goal. You you get bad spots on those two plays there that took points off the board. Really, the offense, in my opinion, only killed it. The only drives they missed are the ones that they killed themselves by either running on second and third down. Tyrod fumbled one by just lost the uh, control of the football one. But back to that halftime situation, Nick. There's 121 left, right? They only get four more plays and three of them are runs. Clock runs out. People tell me in my replies, oh, this was actually perfect management by Brian Dable because you don't want to give the football back to Josh Allen. The focus cannot be on not yes. giving the football back to Josh Allen. The focus has to be on maximizing points. How do I get seven points? I will worry about our defense after, which by the way, was dominant in the first half. And they would have got back on the field there with a minute left or 50 seconds left. And at best, the field, uh, the Bills would have gone to field goal range. I don't even think they would have, though. The defense were playing so well in that first half, and they were so not gassed at that point Dude, yet. It, the defensive wrinkles, down. the defensive wrinkles are are, are creative too. Like oh, the way yeah, the, the Giants were using Xavier and McKinney. Right it was probably it was oh, Wink's best great. game of the year, without a doubt. But yes. my point being, like, don't worry about what Josh Allen's going to do when he gets the football back. You have a minute 21 to go. Worry about getting seven. It can't just always be about three points. We have a little bit of a lead. We're up three, nothing. Let's get it to six, nothing. All right. We're all right. Seven, six. Let's go to nine, seven here with the fourth and inches field goal. It, it just cannot always be about trying to take a little lead or getting some points on the board. Like maximize this shit. Go for seven. You have a minute 21 to go. You got out of bounds with that slate and throw. So the clock is stopped. You don't have to rush the line of scrimmage. Throw the football. Put it in Tyrod's hand. Tyrod was leading a good drive there, and they took it out of his hand by running the football three times in the next four plays. Dude, it cost the Giants a game. The Giants had two defensive pass interference calls at the end of each half, and and they didn't score on either. Like, that's crazy. They had two plays at the one-yard line that they had the opportunity, and we already talked about the, the last one. But then, obviously, the checking in the run, huge gaffe by Tyrod huge Taylor. Mistake. But yep. but Brian Dable, like I said in yesterday's show, put Tyrod in the position to make that just terrible mistake because it didn't have to happen. You're spot on, and you're correct. Look, if you want to preserve the clock, that is a secondary that's a secondary thing, okay? If you don't want Josh Allen, that is a secondary thing right. on your mind. First is we need to get into the end zone and we need to score points, especially for a freaking team, Dan, that hasn't scored a damn touchdown right. since week three. So what are we right. even talking about here? That was an egregious mistake by Brian Dable, and he has and he should have to answer for it because that's not that's you can't do that, dude. You put your yeah. quarterback and then your quarterback didn't bail you out of it. And you know what? When you screw up the clock management and your quarterback also screws up, it's collective. It's on all of you guys, but Brian Dable's not faultless. 
Like people are like, oh, he had 14 seconds left. That's enough time to take two shots to the end zone, blah, 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 kick a field goal. Okay, what about if he had 35 to 40 seconds left? Now you have enough time to use your full playbook. You can run the football and you can get back up and spike it and go to third down and take one more shot. Or you can run the football. You might be able to get touchdown with by you know have being multiple there and having the defense not know if it's going to be run or pass. But either way, with 35 seconds left, there's not as much panic. You have more opportunity to score that. And it was easy to get to 35 seconds. I just felt like they didn't need to take the ball out of Tyrod's hand there. He was running a good drive and there was no reason to go so run heavy after that like i guess the focus was and i'm pretty sure it was nick just don't give josh allen time but like you said that can't be the the primary focus or if you want to win football games it has to be scoring seven points touchdowns it was last year the reason the giants won so many games last year is because they didn't settle for field goals in the red zone the reason the giants are losing so many games this year is because they are settling for field goals or in this case no points in the red zone but yeah, exactly. at least, you know, some of the time the field goal and by the way about that one drive where it's fourth and inches and they kick a field goal Look, I don't like to go about this, but I, I said this last night, and I'll say it again, Nick. At some point, we're going to have to figure out a better way to spot the football rather than just having like <laughs> a, you know, a, a 55-year-old man running down the sideline again with these 25-year-olds and then having to at the same time figure out where the ball was and where the knee went down. Because I rewatched those plays, Nick, and I know you did, obviously, watch the film. The first ball that Saquon Barkley had, that seven-yard run, they spotted that thing between the 13 and 14 yard line. At best, it should have been at the 13 yard line, not in the, and it was closer to the yeah. 14. So at best, they misspotted it by 0.7, by almost a full yard. But at, but that was at best. That's giving them a benefit of the doubt. In reality, his, he lunged out and his knee never hit the ground. Like he went vert, his, his leg was fully vertical. So the ball was actually down closer to the 12 yard line. And then the breeder run right after it, he never went down. He rolled over. So the ball, yeah. I don't know why they didn't just spot that for the first down. It was wild to me. I thought the Giants picked that up too. And of course, didn't go that way and it ends up biting us in the ass. I wanted to put this wait, up. Nick, one more thing. Did you think on the third and one that Taylor made a bad read there? I thought he should have gave the ball to Brita. Yes, he definitely keeping. did. I have it in my notes. Yeah. Okay. He, uh, he should have. I was pissed at that too. I think he should have gave the ball to Brita there. Brita would have picked up that yard easy. We're going to talk, about... yeah, go talk about Tyrod here in a little bit. And Tyrod played phenomenally. He, he, he made mistakes though. And that's going to happen. He's yeah. your backup quarterback. And a lot of those mistakes yeah. were mistakes that you typically don't see from Daniel Jones, like handing the football off. Cause that is one thing that Daniel Jones does like really well. I felt like Tyrod was a little bit, um, he was off cause there was mm -hmm. obvious and certain times that the defender, the pursuit, the pursuit defender stayed and you could have handed the football off, but instead you, you didn't and you got kind of screwed. But I wanted yep. to include this just because, um, A, it's a great combo block by Ben Bredesen and Marcus McKeithen. But watch how McKeithen just Venus fly traps <laughs> Dorian Williams. I don't know why this made me laugh so much, but he gets his eyes on him. And this is good. You're hip to hip with, with um, who was that, Tim Settle. Williams gets sucked in a little bit too far close to the line of scrimmage, tries to scrape right over the top, and then nope. <laughs> he just gets eliminated from the play. Just a good play by McKeithen, who um was solid, was better than the last two weeks. And also, yeah. I, I, I had this one play, too, I wanted to – show because this was right at the beginning of the second half because the Giants were running over route after over route after mm. over route right and this is one of the um aspects of this coaching staff that we applauded last year we haven't seen as much of it this year because the offense has been so inept but watch Isaiah Hodgins here they're gonna run that like play action over route and then you're gonna cut it right back to the outside and it didn't nothing really ends up happening Tyrod Taylor keeps the ball and Kyrie Elam ends up staying on top of it the Giants understood what the bills were doing defensively. And they understood yeah. like, Oh, you're going to pass this off. And Elam passes it off. Watch pass off. He points. And he's like, Oh wait, no, he's coming back my way. Never mind. So, cause Elam and another, if this post route at the top of the screen was a little bit tighter, Elam well, not. there's a center field safety. So never mind. But if there wasn't, Elam might want to try to recover that. Right. And he'll drop the depth to undercut mm -hmm. anything going to the inside. And now you have all that space to the outside, but it's just a little wrinkle. The giants had that I wanted to include. Yeah, the Giants really were well prepared on both sides of the ball. Maybe that has a lot to do with Dable's knowledge of what they're doing there, <laughs> both defensively imagine. and offensively, which is, you know, leads me to believe that's just so it's such an unfortunate season for the Giants because this is a game on paper we went into Nick being like, oh, they're never going to beat the Bills on the road. But the reality is this actually might have been an easier matchup for them than all the other hard games we circled on the schedule because of Dable's familiarity with Josh Allen, what he likes to do, what can hurt him, and what can take away some of the things he likes to do, what can stymie Allen, and then his familiarity with the defense. I know that the Bills have a new coordinator, but they're running a very similar system to what and scheme to what they've always ran under Leslie Frazier. So he just had such intimate knowledge of what they want to do that helps so much. You know, that's something we said about, you know, Jim Schwartz, who just has a really good idea of what Kyle Shanahan wants to run. And you saw it this week. Jim Schwartz completely shut down that 49ers offense. The only team that's been able to do it this year, despite having nothing on offense. You know, they're punting, punting, punting with PJ Walker at quarterback. And yet, dominated the game, won the game in that regard. So 
I just feel like this was such a possible win for the Giants after seeing it on tape. It sucks that they just weren't able to do it. But yeah, so many things had to happen for the Giants to lose this football game. I know the stars were aligned and they just ended up falling out of the sky. And that's just the story of the 2023 season. But you want to get into uh, Tyrod real quick? Yeah, we'll talk Tyrod offensive line and then get into some superlatives. Yeah, man. So Tyrod Taylor, very comfortable in the pocket. And you said he had a longer release, but it's still coming out of his hands quickly. You could see how the blitz was coming in and then Tyrod would think, okay, I'm going to run. And then he would consider it. And this was all happening very quick, right? Like snap, snap, snap. And he would reset his feet and then find an open receiver. Like that happened several times in this football game from a pocket manipulation standpoint, from a decision-making standpoint, other than obviously the end of the half. I feel like Tyrod Taylor was just spot on. The ball was accurate on most plays. There were a couple that were, um, that were a little bit off. There was a Brita check down on third and 11. That was, that was not great. The third and one play uh, quarter four, 1043 left was the one that we were just references should have handed the football off. Didn't had to kick the field goal next play. So not without fault. And again, Dan, it, it's not Tyrod versus Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones can do what Tyrod Taylor just did, mm-hmm. but one of them is making $40 million. The other one is making $5 million. And that's the big difference. And that's something that I think is being lost on a lot of people when, when that debate is being brought up. Yeah, I think that's that's the frame to look at it at if you want to, because that's, you know, we discussed this before the pod. That's that's what I brought up to you. And we were on the same page with that. It's not a matter of who's better, who's worse for the system, who's playing better, who's playing worse. It's a matter of when you watch a game like this, you can kind of see that was there much of a difference between Daniel Jones and Tyrod Taylor? And if the answer to that is no, and we'll let you guys decide that we're not going to make that declaration. You guys think about that. You guys decide that if the answer is no then that's a problem probably, right? Because one guy is a backup yes. quarterback with a $5 million cap at the other guy is a starting quarterback with a $47 million cap at starting next year. And that cap, it only grows year and year. And obviously that doesn't lead the Giants to making a decision like let's not sign Jones because the reason they'd sign Jones and viewed Jones as a different asset than a Tyrod Taylor, who's only 5 million is because Tyrod Taylor's 34 years old and Daniel Jones is 26 years old. So there's room for growth for Daniel Jones. That's the big factor here. But- I think one of the key things here was a lot of people told me, and I always knew this was bullshit, Nick, and I knew it and I saw it all over Twitter and I knew it was just bullshit propaganda type stuff. <laughs> were, no, it was, it was because they told me for the last like two years based on like random preseason clips. Cause we never got to see Tyrod run this offense in a real game until this week. They told me Tyrod sucks. Tyrod's the worst. And I kept reading how bad Tyrod was. And I just kept thinking in my head, let's wait and see him actually operate in a real game in a real, not preseason, and he got in, and I know he's had a few spurts, like when Daniel Jones got hurt, but I meant like a full week yeah. where he had a chance to game plan, get all the reps of the first team offense, get his timing down to some extent. And we saw it. And guess what? He did not suck. Like all you people who said he sucked, he did not suck. He was a really good backup quarterback. That game for a backup quarterback was insane. Did you see Tyler Bajant yesterday for the Bears? He looked horrendous as a backup quarterback. Horrendous. Huge difference. That's a UD or late difference. round sure, pick who's a rookie. And Tyrod no, no, no. Up. But my point being, people yeah. said Tyrod sucked. People kept saying he sucked. That's what sucks looks like. That's what a bad backup yeah. looks like. And most of the backup quarterbacks you watch, aren't going to look like Tyrod looked on tape this week. That's the matter of the fact. There's not a lot of good quarterbacks around the NFL. So it's not a Daniel Jones versus Tyrod Taylor discussion. It won't be here. I still think Daniel Jones gives the Giants the best chance to win. I think he's the 26-year-old that can develop into something better. I don't know if we've seen the best of him. I also think Daniel Jones is just playing rattled this year with a sped-up play clock in his head. Like This is not good for him. He's taking a shit ton of hits this year. He's starting to look at the gas rush. He's He's obviously not playing like he did last year on tape. That's obvious to anyone. So. It's not like I'm comparing this version of Jones to this version of Taylor because Taylor hasn't taken these hits all year. But having said that, you know, Taylor wasn't hit a lot in this game for whatever reason. And he game went against the team who led the league in sacks. So I think part of that is what you said earlier. Taylor was doing a good job of processing all the information fast and getting the football out of his hands in a lot of spots. And that was something that obviously we saw on tape. It's so unfortunate. And I love everything you you just said, man, but the Giants had no business competing on paper with this Buffalo Bills team. You have your backup quarterback in there. You have Justin Pugh starting at guard. He has to kick out to play left Four tackle. guards on the offensive line. Four guards on the offensive line. Justin Pugh was straight off the couch, straight off the couch man. Like yeah. He was just straight off the couch. And he's playing left tackle for you against a team that leads the league in sacks. And you were this close to winning the football game. Yeah. Like, 
this close and it just didn't work. I thought you did a good job breaking it down. I thought he did a good job processing information, Did a good, made two explosive field side throws, the two we broke down, the slot fades. We haven't seen field side throws down the field all year, so that was just nice to see. I thought, again, like I said earlier, they were able to expand a little bit of the playbook, allowing him to do the boot action to the left because he's a much better quarterback in my mind. This is not a knock on Jones. He's He is better at Jones, though, when he's rolling to his opposite shoulder. That's just a matter of fact. He is a better thrower rolling to his opposite shoulder. That's pretty obvious to anyone. I hope it's not controversial. He's a little more natural while throwing to uh, while rolling to his left. And also, I think he did a really good job manipulating the pocket in this game. But he's not without his faults. This wasn't perfect film at all from Tyrod Taylor. So I want to make it clear that I'm not saying it is. He had bad ball placement on the Wandell Robinson throw that went for about six or eight yards. I don't have the timestamp now. Where if he gets that ball out faster and to the outside shoulder, that's a huge play. He had bad ball placement on a throw to Darren Waller that I don't have a perfectly timestamp right now. Where the the throw was low and inside. So his ball placement wasn't perfect in this game. I thought at times he missed plays. Like, for example, Nick, the third and 12 play, or the third and eight play, just before the Giants turned over the ball on downs late in the fourth quarter before their final drive. He had Wandell Robinson open on the whip route. He should have thrown there. He ended up throwing downfield to Jalen Hyatt, hoping for like a long pass interference call, which I don't hate in general from quarterbacks. I think it's smart, and I kind of wish the Giants would do that a little bit more often in general to try to get those DPIs down the field for like 40-yard you know, penalties. But he had Wandell Robinson open on that whip route. If he processed that and saw Robinson and got the ball out, Robinson had a lot of space to be graded on that whip route and probably would have got a first down and maybe more because it was a linebacker who was in coverage on that play, 45, I believe. If I remember against Wandale on that whip route. So he completes that. Wandale might be able to go up the sideline with Dylan Hyatt carrying all those defenders on the vertical plane. So Taylor had some misses in this game as well. And the film was nowhere near perfect. No, it wasn't perfect, but man, he really stepped into a oh, tough yeah. spot on the road. You know, heartstrings being pulled since he has experience with Buffalo and played. Very well. Put his team in a position to win the football game, despite the fact that the offense still frankly sucks and hasn't scored a touchdown since week three, to put it all <laughs> into perspective. But one major plus, Dan, was the offensive line and how they played in this game, just night and day of what they were over the previous several weeks against, again, the team that led the league in sacks. I think a lot of this had to do with A, Tyrod Taylor getting rid of the football and playing on schedule, B, the Giants' game plan. I feel like they had a much better game plan in this game than they did in the previous games. And also Justin Pugh, which is crazy to say and crazy to to really just have like this is a reality this is like something out of like a hollywood or something you know like oh yeah this guy was chilling on his couch he's gonna go and play left guard wow really oh no now he has to be left tackle because josh azudu got hurt okay let's do and other than the first couple series i think it was maybe he had a couple Mm -hmm. plays where he was very very good out there just solid didn't really make any mistakes giants play calling i also felt like helped mitigate the pass rush of the um of the Buffalo Bills and also Saquon Barkley too. I think the presence of Saquon Barkley made that much of a difference as well, but I've been encouraged by Justin Pugh, by Mark Lewinsky. I didn't think I was going to say that yeah. one player though. And I wanted to get your opinion on this. I thought Ben Bredesen had a better game too, but Evan Neal's still man. Like I know. the first few drives of the game, I was like, what are you doing? Like in the run game, man, like I'm showing a couple clips of him having nice combo blocks with McKeith and he, he has that, but then it's like him one-on-one and everything's blocked up well. And he just falls. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, you look at his feet. It's like, did he get rolled up on? It's like, no, it's like, what is your problem with balance? Like why, why, why do you have like a handful of plays that are like this when it's not even like you're losing the leverage battle? It's just like, you're not in position and then you get extended over your feet. Next thing you know, you're on the ground and Saquon's getting tackled for a loss of two. It's crazy to say, Nick, but going into last week, I feel like the film told the story that Neil was better than people thought on the broadcast. And going into this week, my expectation for Neil was the film was going to be so much better based on what I thought I saw on the broadcast. And it actually, unfortunately, was so much worse. And he still had some really good reps, like you talked about. Some of those combo blocks were awesome stuff. Um, but just overall, it just didn't, like you said, he just was imbalanced. There were too many run plays where I was just like, everything was blocked up right except for Neil. And I was like, damn, like that's not what you want to see. You don't want to see him on the ground there and him getting off balance like he tends to be. And and here's the thing also about Neil right now. He's playing through a really bad ankle injury, I think. And I think point. Just has, they have no option but to play him. Like he got injured at one point in the game and it was like limping back to the huddle. And I think the announcers uh, noticed it and said it, or maybe it was one of the beat reporters that I was following on Twitter at the time. But like, what was the option at that point? Limp to the huddle and figure it out and play through whatever the hell this is, as long as you can physically just be out there, which he was able to. Because it has to be Mc- McKeithen. 
has to be McKeithen. It would have had right? to be McKee- McKeithen. And then oh God, who would have even played guard? Like, it's just like an absolute Mayfield. <laughs> Mayfield then moves into oh. the freaking thing. So it's like, you know, you got McKeithen Mayfield out there, but obviously the Giants opted to, and Neil obviously. I, and I think that's something that he deserves a little bit of credit for toughing it out these last couple of weeks of while playing through injury. And some no one's talking about that, you know, all the comments about the lion or whatever, the sheep, like he's p- playing through these injuries, which deserves credit for. Like not everybody plays through injuries. I know some people, you know, refer to players as quote unquote soft. This is not what Evan Neal is. Like, I don't think he ever has been. His issues are not being soft. His issues are balance related and speed related. Yeah, he's, that's lion and lion activity for sure. To play through it. Yeah. Oh, it's absolute lion. And no sheep would ever do that. It's but pure lion. To focus on more of the positive. Justin Pugh, like you said, because I didn't want to let that, you know, bury the lead because we, we moved over to Neil. But like, it's just amazing to watch that tape and watch a player like Neil. He wasn't like Andrew Thomas level, obviously. Like, we've seen great tape of a Giants tackle. We saw a full season's worth last year. That wasn't what we saw here. But he just didn't make a lot of the mistakes that we're so used to seeing offensive linemen make. He didn't really make any of the mistakes. He had a couple bad snaps, one where he didn't know. that. And, and after the game, by the way, I don't know if you saw this today, Nick, but it was either Duggan or... Uh, Stapleton who tweeted about this or, ta- or talked about this, I think, or maybe it was Ron. I don't know, but they said that he was so not used to being on this team in this offensive line and playing tackle. that He had to guess a lot of the snap counts. Like he was just guessing out there. Yeah. And that's crazy to work. Like he's comp- that just think about how stacked the deck was against Justin Pugh last night off the streets, off the couch, as he says, you know, on the NBC uh, intro, all, all straight off my couch two weeks ago, then f- practices, barely gets up to left guard, pre- prepares to play left guard, forced to move over to tackle, doesn't know the snap counts, just guessing half of the game, and yet holds his own to an insane degree for all those factors that were stacked against him. He's going to be, I believe, Nick, he has a couple practice squad designations still left, but this is over, right? Like the Giants can't yeah. move him down to the practice squad. Someone will claim him immediately. He just put out that kind of tape. And like the minute every NFL team has access to everybody's tape, Right, the red, the Washington football team is going to be watching the Giants tape immediately. They would immediately probably claim them to their roster. I, I can think of a lot of other teams. So the Giants are going to be an interesting spot here, Nick, because Justin Pugh has said, like, all I want for you guys to do is you can sign in the practice squad at first, but if you give me a shot and I prove capable of what I think I'm capable of, which is exactly what he did, you need to give me a fair contract offer commes- commis- that commiserates or not commiserates. Um, that is commiserate. Is that the word? Commensurate commensurate you're always you have so many you have insane vocabulary commensurate with my play on the field and so the giants don't have a lot of cap space to work with right now so i'm curious what they're even going to do because the other option is not an option they can't let him go at this point he's locked in and i made the case today and yesterday on our pod nick i think given the state of the offensive line around the nfl how hard it is to find competent play if he continues to have a stretch of competent play over the rest of the season i want him resign long term not long 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 term but for the next two years or this year and next year, or this year, next year, and the year after, because he's only going to be 35 or 36 by that. No, he's 33. He'll be 35 by that point or 36. That's fine. Andrew Whitworth played to like 39. <laughs> like, so just, I need competent play. I need a tactician. I need someone who is going to age well. Like I feel like he is now the issue being the reason they didn't resign him in the first place was the injuries. And he tore his ACL last year. It's not like he has been injury proof recently. So we have to consider that as well. But at this stage of the game, Nick, like to get competent play like we got from Justin Pugh on tape this week, you don't see it around the Giants offensive line. You didn't really see it with Bredesen in this game. In my opinion, you didn't see it with McCathan. I guess he was okay at times in the run game. Neil okay at times in the run game, not consistent. Left guard, not consistent, even though better at times. So this is like something you have. You don't have a lot of competency on the O line. So when you have it, Dude, keep it. He understands how to play offensive line. That's something that's yeah. overlooked. Look, like there's a lot yeah. of guys out there who are just really large and they're just kind of punching exactly. and getting in your way. This guy knows how to manipulate your leverage, knows where mm-hmm. his hands are supposed to go. If you do this, I do this to counter that. He is a tech, he's a technical savant as an offensive lineman. Might not be the most physically gifted, but that's not what we need. We need somebody who's going to shut down opposing rushers. Right. And he did that. That's what he did yet in yesterday's game was very impressive. That's something that Insane. we might be talking about from here. Remember that time Justin Pugh just came in and we almost beat the Bills? Hopefully at that time we have a couple more Super Bowl rings. You know what I'm saying? Because the Giants <laughs> need, to, need to get on it, man. The Giants need to win some some damn football games. But yeah, I didn't want to be too negative with Evan Neal, but Justin Pugh, holy no. crap. Yeah. That I don't was, think it's uh, negativity. I think you were just pointing out what you saw on tape with Neil. And, and unfortunately, it wasn't the film we were hoping to see. 
No, yeah. not at all. Especially after like we talked our, and I don't even want to say we talked ourselves into him being good luck. Cause he had some good sets. He also had some mm-hmm. bad mistakes, which we brought up yeah. and I just wanted another step, especially since the giants were you know, competitive in this game. And uh, to be honest, I just didn't see it, man. No, I didn't either. And we'll see what happens with that. Maybe he's playing, maybe it's partially the injury, but I don't yeah. want to lean on that again, you know, uh, Nick, because we did say that all last year. Remember we talked about, Oh, Howard cross talked to Carl banks and he told Carl banks, look, man, I'm on the sideline, played a lot of football. Neil just wasn't healthy in the lower half. We can't judge on it. It'd be like, yeah. if we can't keep leaning on that, that's, this is how we dig ourselves into holes with, with Giants roster players by always leaning on the, well, if he's not injured or because he's injured, we can't fairly adjust, assess him, things like that. We got to bring in another veteran offensive lineman. Someone's got to call Bussin with the boys, man. Get Taylor Luan's ass up here. Yeah. People want to get DJ <laughs> Fluker in the mix or Lel Collins. Yo, um, Fluke. Throw it all back and just get all vets. But, you know, at some point in me, I wants to say, Nick, like, oh, I should be in the camp of let's – only go young on the offensive line. You want cheap guys on rookie deals who have room to grow. But the other part of me is like, eh, offensive line play sucks so bad. And these guys so rarely develop the way you hope and expect them to. Let's just get vets. Let's just get dudes who can freaking play the position and then worry about contracts and age and your future later. Like, I just need competent play. Without competent offensive line play, the offense is dead and has no ceiling. Real quick before we do the superlatives and get out of here, think about how much flexibility Justin Pugh just provided the Giants offensive line. Say if Andrew Thomas comes mm-hmm. back in two weeks. Now what are you going to do with Justin Pugh? You can do whatever you want. You put him at guard. If Evan Neal is injured, if Evan Neal really does struggle, you have that. Like It just gives you so much more flexibility. And this is a guy who was straight chilling on his couch last week. Which is crazy to think about the Giants. Won- how many games this season where they could have used Justin Pugh for literally since week one, they could have used Justin Pugh. And the season could have been different. I don't know. Maybe they could have had a better chance. I don't think it would have been. I don't think he's that heroic to have yeah. dug them out of a lot of the holes they've been in in some of these games. But like, I don't know, man. This dude's just been sitting on his couch, and yet the entire time he was sitting on his couch was probably the second. Well, Andrew Thomas had been out. He probably would have literally been the best Giants offensive lineman in every game over the last four or five weeks since Thomas's injury because he was the best Giants offensive lineman last night. Yes, let's get into some superlatives. Yeah, let's wrap Damn. it up with some superlatives. Unheralded player. You want to go first? I had two guys that were close for me. So in the end, I went with Wandell Robinson. Wandell Robinson made some insanely important third down conversions, third and seven, uh, third and nine, uh, third and six, if I believe. I think he had three third down conversions in this game, but I might be wrong. Don't quote me on that. On all of those conversions, he also had the whip route on the end of the game on third and eight that Tyrod missed would have been a conversion. He had a ton of space off that whip route created by himself. On all of those plays, yes, was the coverage soft, sure. But on every one of those plays, dude, he did not waste space post-catch. He got vertical, understanding that every time he got vertical, Nick, he was going to take a massive shot, and he took massive shots. He came up limping or gimpy on two of those, knowing he's going to go in, take those hits, get his team the first down, that's what an unheralded player is to me. So he won it for me, but the close second for me, Nick, the close second was Jalen Hyatt, who saw his snap count increase in this game, made the incredibly unheralded play of catching that pass on fourth and five to keep the game alive, knowing yeah. he's going to crushing hit. At no alligator arms, no dropping the football after the hit, no looking and keeping his eyes off the ball and on the defender. Caught it, took it, and made the scramble play with, with Tyra Taylor that we went over earlier that should have been a 43-yard completion. Wasn't. It was called back but was a really nice play that would have been big on the game, but mostly for that fourth and five conversion. So I'm giving it to Wandell Robinson, but a close second for me was Jalen Hyatt. And I think your call is also a good one, by the way. Mark Glowinski back into the lineup, played all 48 snaps for the Giants. And look, he gave up, I think, what, one pressure, if I'm not mistaken. But holy crap, dude, he looked like he had a different level of speed that he was unlocking and a different motivation almost. And I'm not calling him out saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying he got benched for all these young guys who have sucked and who have been struggling. And he played really well, man. And he was coming out of his stance. The Giants utilized his athletic ability and kicking him out to take the end man on the line of scrimmage, whether it be running or even sometimes in pass protection to help protect Tyrod Taylor. So yeah, Mark Lewinsky to me, I'm look, I understand your limitations and pass blocking when the Giants want to do five, seven step drops and somebody just bull rushes you mm-hmm. or uses power against you. That didn't happen all that often in this game. And Mark Lewinsky came, was impressive to me. So I had to, you know, Give him the uh, most unheralded. Best route run of the game, Nick. We have the same call for this. You can break it down. Ah, Darius Slayton slot fade 1.0. We went over it about, what, 40 minutes ago. 
on the podcast. He's just yep. able to win outside, dip the inside shoulder, and created ample space against great former release. first round pick Kyrie Elam. So it was just a great release and allowed Tyrod Taylor a lot of space to put the football over top of him and lead him towards the sideline and upfield. So that's what we're going with. Best throw for me is also um, that same thing as well. It's the the slot fade. So I'll just kind of jump ahead of you there. Yeah, my best throw is the one we broke down earlier. We did we did all three angles on it. The end zone angle I had really, I think, shows just how good that throw was. It's Tyrod Taylor scary. scrambling from the pocket, rolling to his opposite shoulder, somehow finds a way to flip his hips around, rip a ball out there 45 yards down the field, and not only that, but throw it to space to where the receiver is, leading the receiver toward that out-of-bounds mark, but keeping his feet in. It's just a beautiful, beautiful-looking throw. The best throw I've seen all season – by any Giants quarterback, that's not a knock on Daniel Jones. He's had tough stuff to deal with, bad O-line, all the stuff. And last year, Jones had a very good throw to Hodgins, similar to that one in the Vikings playoff game where he was forced to roll to his left and throw toward the sideline to Hodgins and lead him out there. And he did all of those same things. But this year, that was the best throw I saw on tape uh, for the Giants. Let's get to the best player overall. This is an interesting one. I'm curious to get your take on that. It could have been a lot of people. Look, Saquon had some good runs at the end of the game. I felt like early on before those runs, Saquon didn't look like Saquon Barkley. He looked, looked like he was playing with an injury, but we, we brought up some of his really nice runs, and he finished the game strong, put the Giants in a position to win. So all things considered, this could have went to Wondell Robinson. This could have went to Jalen Hyde. This could have went to Tyrod Taylor easily, Darius Slade. And I'm actually going to go with Justin Pugh. We talked a lot about him already. I just think what he was able to achieve against all odds, really, it was pretty remarkable and it stabilized the offense and it allowed them to at least move the football down to the one yard line twice, even though there were some pass interference calls that helped with that. But the offense was at least functional and he was a reason for that. So I have to go with Justin Pugh. I had a tougher time with this one, Nick. I just, it was tough for me to figure out the, the only people who were in consideration for best player on offense were the five you mentioned. I didn't think I could give it to, and, and Slayton as well. I didn't think you could give it to any of those guys, Wandell Slayton, Hyatt, just because, especially Slayton, because he didn't come down with that catch at the end. But even Wandell Hyatt, just yeah. not enough. For me, this would have been an easy, easy Tyrod Taylor, if not for how he screwed up at the, at the end of the halftime. That is such a big decision by him and such a mistake that it does take me off of giving him best player overall. If you take that off, and, you know, he missed the the whip route. I, I wrote in my notes, and because yeah, he missed yeah. the whip route and the stupid, and, and, and you know, a couple off-target throws, but mostly just because before the halftime he checked into that run and killed the Giants from getting three points there. That was the reason I couldn't give it to Tyrod. Other than that, I think he was the best player on tape, but I was going to, I think in the end, I had just have to give it to the guy who played the most snaps and had the most consistent best tape of that. And that's Justin Pugh, as you said. So he gets it from both of us. Give me a pass blocking grade one through 10. I have a 6.2. I'm wondering if it's too high. The football was coming out of Tyrod's hand very quickly. Everything was dialed. Not everything was dialed up deep con or quick concepts, but the deep concepts typically came off of play action. But the pass blocking held up, I would say, better than adequate for this team, for the personnel that they had out there. So 6.2, which is probably, I would imagine, the highest grade that I've given them this year, maybe Arizona. Yeah, I'd have to look back at that Arizona game. I don't remember what grade you I don't or know, I we weren't do. doing We weren't doing superlatives, mm. so... But I, I probably would have had a better grade then. I think I would have given Arizona a better grade. I gave this one a 4.8. I think a lot of this was just Tyrod Taylor getting rid of the ball so fast and the game plan as well to get the ball out of his hand so fast. There were some good blocks. I just feel like still McKethan bothers me in pass protection to a to a large degree. I I, I worry about his long-term future based on that. I thought Bredesen was not so good in pass protection here. You're right, though. Glowinski didn't make as many mistakes. He's just used to seeing him in pass pro, but... And Neil's issues were more in the run game this game, but I, I just don't know if I could give this too much of, uh, you know, above a five grade. So I went 4.8 there. What about the run blocking? Run blocking 4.9 for me. Fourth quarter, they ended up opening up some really nice holes, that, but there were times where Saquon mm -hmm. basically always had to deal with Terrell Bernard or a safety at the line of scrimmage and try to make something happen. And he, I don't think he was playing at 100%, so not a lot happened for him. No. But yeah, I'm going to say a 4.9. And Evan Neal's just kind of really the anchor sinking that great as well because he just did not look despite having some blocks. great blocks other than yeah. the combos those combo down blocks yeah. on the three tech that we were bringing up the under front those were pretty good a lot of that was also mckeith and also just set up a sure. better angle for evan neal to get up to the linebacker but outside of those blocks it, it just um just leaves some to be desired man and that's just come on let's yeah. get it together it's your second year bro i know they're gonna have to see some improvement there but 5.1 for me uh, some really big splash plays that we talked about in the run game that I thought brought it to an average point, but obviously some mistakes as well. I, my whole thing is though, like I rewatched those big runs by Barkley. I don't know how much of those, like 
Barkley had the, made the man miss in the second one was great. Barkley, the first one was just perfectly well designed and perfectly yep. well blocked by the Giants. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was just well that executed. Jet motion, that jet, jet motion, man. That jet motion. Like, so I guess that's partially on the scheme too. So maybe I should knock this back. Yeah, I'm going 4.6 now that I think about it because that's scheme and blocking and run blocking. I don't know if we marry them together, if we try to separate yeah, them. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fine. Yeah, I got you. All right, thanks so much for tuning into Big Blue Banter Podcast. Thank you to everyone who joined the live show last night after the game. We'll be doing that every week as we have been. And for those of you who donated to the Super Chat, and thank you so much to those who donated to the Super Chat mailbag last week as well. Thank you to everybody who follows and doesn't donate. doesn't matter. We don't judge. I mean, look, everybody has their own situation. You can, may have a lot of uh, ex- disposable income. You may not. Either way, we appreciate you listening. We appreciate you watching. We appreciate you downloading. We appreciate you hitting the like button. There are a lot of free ways to help us as well. Those are just as important to us. You can like the show. You can subscribe to the show. That is free. Only takes two seconds and a click. That really helps us. You can download the show if you listen on audio, on podcast or Spotify, on iTunes or Spotify. The download is what we live on. So it's not the play. It's the download. So please, if you do enjoy the show, please just download the show. Help us grow. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your week. You'll hear us next with the defensive film breakdown.